Okay, <clears throat> good morning. Welcome to putting Jira to good use in Hyper-V clusters here at PSConf EU 2023. Thanks for sticking around for so long. Um, as always, a heartfelt thanks to our sponsors who make this event possible year after year. And, of course, a heartfelt thanks to the speaker, without whom this particular talk would not be taking place. I'm Evgeny. Um, I live in Berlin, work as a senior solutions architect at Semperis. So, basically, in the security space, I blog. I lead three Microsoft-themed uh, user groups in Berlin, and uh, I'm a Microsoft Cloud and Data Center uh, Management MVP in the third years year. I spoke at this event and in other events before. Nothing much to see here. So, what will there be in this session? We will look at what exact problem we will be trying to solve here. We will look at why the achieving this objective actually presents a problem and what solution approaches there are to attack that. And then I will take you on a journey that I did three or four times with different teams. The reason I will not be presenting a polished one-size-fits-all uh, module or a set of modules or a stack of modules and uh, services is that, uh, to my big surprise, one size does absolutely not fit all when it comes to providing user experience to non-administrators. So I did that three or four times, and at those points where we had to decide about architecture, different teams at different customers decided differently. So I will present concepts, I will present working code, but packaging this into a solution is something that every organization will have to figure out for, for themselves. So we'll start at level two, 200, look into GIA, look into what's possible with GIA in uh, regard of uh, Hyper-V management, and um, then we move from there, level 300, level 400, and then we will leap upwards from there, look at the ultimate user experience for non-administrators on Hyper-V, uh, and uh, then we'll wrap up uh, with things still left to do. Something that there will not be in this session, AI. Because, no? <laughs> PowerShell 7, although some... Some of the uh, scripts and commands that I will be showcasing here absolutely will work in 7, but not everything. Windows Terminal, for the same reason. We're running on servers. The client pieces would not work in term, uh, would, would work in terminal, but my whole lab here is on server OSs only, so no terminal for us. There will be no cloud. There is a way to, to put parts of these solutions in place using Azure Arc, I may or may not be presenting that at a future point in time. So, instead of formulating the objective myself, I resort to NIST, to the official NIST publication from a couple of years ago, that details that basically if you delegate control of virtual machines to specific, specific users or group of users, there should be de segregation of duty. I looked up the German, uh, the German BSE Grundschutz, which is the sister document to that. Those guys are much more vague, but NIST, NIST put it, puts it 
in great detail that uh, per both the permission assignment level and the object level and uh, the ability to deny at least should be there. And that's what we will be doing in the next uh, 30 minutes. We will try to delegate to, let's say, application administrators the management of their VMs that comprise their respective application. So it's basically stuff like yeah, viewing the VMs that belongs, belong to me, to my application. Are they healthy? Are they running? Then sort of like stopping a VM, starting a VM, maybe altering parts of the configuration of that VM. That's, that's the tasks uh, that we're uh, talking about. We're not talking about delegating host management or storage management or anything along these lines. We will be talking in this session strictly about delegation of uh, VM management. So what's in the box with Hyper-V? Uh, uh, let's have a show of hands. Who all is using uh, Hyper-V in production? Excellent, excellent. 50% of the audience. That's, uh, that's great. The rest, I would assume, are using VMware, where RBAC was a thing for the, na for the last like uh, 15 years and is implemented very nicely. It was not always the case. There was always RBAC, but it was not always implemented very nicely. But today, uh, VMware RBAC is actually what we should be shooting for in our, uh, in our efforts to provide similar experiences uh, for Hyper-V. So Hyper-V Manager, you manage everything that is running on a single host with it. You can even move VMs between hosts with this thing. Is a MMC-based uh, tool, great for seasoned Windows administrators. If your Hyper-V hosts are clustered, enter the cl failover cluster manager that uh, integrated parts of the Hyper-V manager to enable management of this specific type of uh, a cluster role, which is a clustered virtual machine. Nothing much uh, different here. There is, of course, a PowerShell module. There is also a PowerShell module for failover clusters that has a couple of specialized commandlets for the virtual machine uh, role class. And the new, relatively new kid in town is the Windows Admin Center that provides like this web-based server management experience. Server management experience, by the way, was the original name of the Windows Admin Center as it came to be uh, around 2018, uh, 2017, 18, 19. Everything at Microsoft was an experience. Uh, even Microsoft Word, like and, uh, inserting a symbol into a paragraph was the symbol insertion experience. Uh, and so, so the Windows Admin Central's re original name was Server Management Experience. This is important for, for this session at a later time. So the problem is, if we look at all these tools, they have all one thing in common. The delegation is practically zero. If you Google role-based access control Hyper-V, there will be tons of results that point to uh, authorization management, manager-based uh, delegation engine. It was there in server 2008 or two. But since then, it's deprecated. There is still an authorization engine behind this, but Microsoft does not disclose, not even to an MVP in this category, uh, what it technically is. There is, uh, there is a uh, Hyper-V administrators group which will give you 
most of the host management tasks you can't you can't reboot the server but you can you can manage more or less everything hyper v related on that server and of course all the vms so doesn't help much because if you assign your users uh, that uh, sort of group they will still be able to log on to the server and break your host and um, see and manage all the foreign vms so this is the problem that we will try to overcome. And of course, if we're thinking about software architectures for delegations, there are two solution approaches. You could have an agent rolled out to each host, provide your own user interface, whatever it is, that communicates uh, with the backend, and the backend communicates with the agent, and the agent runs in the system context so that your solution is doing the airbag uh, and uh, the agent is uh, more or less a slave doing what it's told. This is the model that System Center Virtual Machine Manager will use, right? The other approach is you, again, provide your own management experience, your own front end for that. For, for that. Do the ARBEC evaluation in there. And then you get out with a God-level account using the standard remoting protocols and more or less do this uh, uh, allowed action using a God-level account remotely. There is an example of such a solution, Hyper-V Manager. It's still a commercial product that is still being sold. If uh, any one of you attended my first session on Monday, you know keeping secrets is my pet topic. Uh, this thing stores those God-level accounts credentials in clear text in a user-readable uh, SQLite database. So please do not use this tool. So, but since we are at the PowerShell conference and talking about delegation, Jia comes to mind more or less immediately. Anybody here not attended Fred's session previously in this room? Okay, so 10 second Gia, uh, because Fred showed quite nicely how, how that is designed and deployed. Gia works in a way that you have your users use the WinRAM transport to connect to a certain endpoint. If you say enter PS session or invoke command or new PS session, you have a parameter here named configuration name, and that's the name of the GIA endpoint or WinRM endpoint uh, that you're going to connect to. If you connect to a certain WinRM endpoint you are allowed to connect to, then whoever registered that endpoint can very precisely define what modules you are allowed to load, what commandlets will be visible from those modules, what parameters those commandlets may have, and even what values you are allowed to specify to those uh, command uh, parameters. But once this is done, if you, uh, if you invoke a command that you are allowed to invoke, the command itself will run using a highly privileged account in the most general case, it will be a virtual account that is tied to your um, uh, identity, but it could be an explicitly specified user account, it could be a group managed service account, and so on. But by default, if you do not specify anything, a GIA endpoint will run with a virtual account that has local admin right, rights on that machine. So, level 200, what could we achieve by using GIA in regard to our objective? We could restrict an application owner by providing a role for, I don't know, application X <clears throat> to only use or see the get VM commandlet, the stop VM commandlet, sorry, and the start VM commandlet. We could restrict uh, the uh, available parameters to name only and, thank you very much, and we could, of course, restrict the 
the, the, the values that could be provided as name to the machines that uh, belong to, to that application. There is a problem with that. If we do that, he, you cannot invoke those commandlets without specifying the parameters anymore. So you can't just expect, I will do a get VM, and I only get to see the VMs that I'm allowed to see. That will not happen. You need to know what VMs are there. Furthermore, if you get new VMs assigned to you, if, you get, if VMs get renamed, then this GIA configuration must be redone because it's all stored in those role capability files. So you will have to re-register the GIA endpoint, which means restarting WinRM service, which means severing all the sessions that are active at that time. Not very comfortable. But in this way, we could achieve granularity both in VMs and in possible actions, but it would not be a convenient PowerShell manner. You could not even do get VM uh, like VM01 pipe stop VM, if stop VM is also constrained to, uh, uh, to, to certain names. And you must do that. This is what I said. Role capabilities are static, so if there is any dynamic in there, then you have to restart. Let's look at a more intelligent GIA approach. So what would we do? We would not use the business logic of, um, of uh, the uh, built-in GIA to uh, restrict the user from accessing foreign VMs or doing action they are not allowed to do. But for that, we would need to provide the permissions topology. We would we need to store somewhere what VMs the user is allowed to see, what VMs they are allowed to start, stop, reconfigure, or, or whatever. And then we need to map the identity of the running GIA endpoint to the identity connecting to the GIA endpoint because things like user, username will not work. So we need some kind of data store. If you know me, you would expect SQLite. SQLite will come at some point uh, into play. For the first uh, demonstration, we will use a simple CSV table. For identity, there is a really, really nifty object. You, virtual or automatic variable called PS sender info that contains the whole Windows identity of the connecting user, including their SID and including the SIDs of all the groups the user is member in. So, could be a good fit for mapping this. So let's do a level 200 demo. What we have here is a host. On this host, there are like five, uh, six VMs. And uh, the first letter is more or less whom they belong to. Like the A VMs belong to Alice, the B VMs belong to Bob, and the C VM belongs to Charlie. Um, we put a very simple GIA endpoint on on that uh, Hyper-V host, and the endpoint is configured in the following way. Let me scroll it up. It has a global access group. This is not a permission group. This uh, HVCO global is not a permission group. It's a, more or less a connection group. That, those are the users that are allowed to connect to our RBAC-enabled, uh, GIA-enabled Hyper-V host. Um, and uh, they all get the role very simple GIA assigned. And this role capability is stored in the module, and um, 
at the core of, of our RBAC is a simple CSV table that just maps SIDs from Active Directory to machine names, and the last two, uh, last two columns are one for can start or, uh, and one for can stop. So a a any, any machine where there is some kind of SID to name mapping will be, uh, will be viewable by that user or a member uh, of that group. Uh, and if there is a one in one of the columns, then uh, an operation against that machine will be um, <clears throat> possible. And in this uh, module, we have uh, we have a command uh, function that is called update my VM list, and this uh, does nothing fancy. It imports uh, the, the default Hyper-V module. Uh, it reads the authorization table. And, uh, and of course, all the right host, um, right host outputs are strictly for the purpose of this demo here. And going through the VMs read from the host and through the authorization table, it will populate three global lists, uh, uh, my VM get list, my VM start list, and my VM stop list. And those variables are global for the session. So then, if I uh, invoke get my VM, uh, maybe passing passing it an array of names, maybe not. Then it would return all the VMs that I'm allowed to uh, to get. It will basically create a list of a cross section of what I specified and what I'm allowed to see. And then for every VM name that I am allowed to see, it just returns the output of the standard get VM command. Nothing fancy here. Let's see how that works. I registered that endpoint already. So we are logged on as Alice. And if I say connect, enter PS session, very simple Gia. And then on loading the session, it will invoke this list, uh, list command so uh, that we can see we had 12 lines in that authorization table. And those 12 lines lead to two VMs available to Alice. And this uh, get VM, I can't do get VM, but I can do get my VM. And uh, I get only the two VMs that are assigned to me by role-based access control. Could do the same thing for stopping and starting, but this is a very simple thing. And by the way, I've built a small function into that role capability that allows us to determine who we are. And here is how this virtual identity is called. You always see the real identity within the virtual identity name, but of course, using the PS sender info uh, variable with all those SIDs in the data structure is much more convenient for us uh, automators, right? So this is level 200. Any questions so far? Go. Yeah, one question. Would this actually work for somebody who got only simple user rights in Active Directory for The question was, would that work for somebody who've, who's got rights, uh, who's got administrator or any kind of elevated rights in Active Directory? Let's have a look. Alice Ackermann. Here you go. Domain users, connecting group, and an authorization group for HVCO-A, which is the, the SID that we saw in the table. That's, that's the beauty of GIA. You allow users explicitly to connect to an endpoint. Alice could not connect, by the way. Uh, we could do the experiment. Alice could not connect to the default endpoint. 
Alice is only allowed to connect to our very simple GIA endpoint that we, defi uh, we defined because we allowed that explicitly. No, no. Alice has no privileges whatsoever on that machine. But she will be able to run commands as a administrator account within a GEO endpoint. So, more demanding clients. You could do a real RBAC for Hyper-V using this approach only. But there are two problems when you roll that out to real people. Named endpoints. People hate named endpoints. We as administrators usually have no problem with that. It could even be good to have named endpoints for like segregation of duty. If, if, if I intend to, to manage print stuff on that machine, I connect to the endpoint print management and GIA uh, makes, uh, makes sure that I do not do anything else and I could connect with the same credentials uh, to another endpoint and be able to do another talk. Application administrators, they will hate that. They will hate this stuff will get frustrated and run to the management and request their admin rights back. You could, in theory, bend the default endpoint to your will, sort of, to mimic this experience on the default endpoint. Do not do that. Please do not do that at home in production, because... You cannot, uh, the, the, the difference between the default, or one of the differences between the default endpoint and the endpoint we just created is the endpoint we just created runs as a restricted remote server session type, which means it runs in, in restricted language mode. The default endpoint is unrestricted. So you either restrict your administrators to the restricted language mode, Or you provide your users the unrestricted language. Both are bad. If you start playing around with the default endpoint and, well, brick it, recreating the default endpoint is easy. You just unregister that and issue enable dash ps remoting with force and then the default endpoints are back there. Custom commandlet's name, same thing. An application administrator who never touched Hyper-V in their lives could be taught using get my VM because they do not know that there is get VM. Most of the people have done some kind of um, uh, virtualization management, so they will keep issuing get VM <laughs> where uh, uh, in reality, they should be doing get my VM in this uh, example and will get frustrated. You could use proxy functions. You could absolutely use proxy functions, override the default functions. You need to specify the fully qualified module name for the original Hyper-V commandlets within those uh, functions, but that will work. That will work. Of course, your functions will behave differently from uh, uh, the uh, built-in functions. This could be both a curse and a blessing, depending on what your application administrators are trying to do with that. Which leads us to a slightly different approach to, uh, to this whole thing. If you look at how you manage the... And I, I hope this resonates, because that's what I know. I've been doing Hyper-V since there is Hyper-V, and I've been doing PowerShell since there is PowerShell. Um, even full admins will not enter a session to do Hyper-V commandlets in that session, usually. On the console, interactively, they usually will try to run the commandlets locally and just specify the remote host to connect to That's the experience that I'm aware of among administrators. And that provides actually a very good way 
to hide both pain points in this simple GR approach. We absolutely define a custom endpoint on our Hyper-V host, but instead of giving the application administrators the default Hyper-V module, we give them our own module that exports, for instance, a get VM command. And that get VM command has a computer name parameter. And if they issue that, then under the hood, our command will connect to the host they are specified, to the, uh, to the custom endpoint that is configured, and run the custom named commandlets that is present in that, uh, in that module. And that commandlet, get RBAC VM in, in this case, will utilize, after checking the RBAC of course, uh, will utilize Hyper-V uh, uh, native commandlets to provide the VM information. Let's see how that works. So, we are still Alice, and instead of connecting to the machine, I import a module Hyper-V management. Nobody has ever heard of that module because I designed it myself. And if I do this, This is a different ARBIC data source. That's why Alice is able to see the um, CVM. She's allowed to, to, to view an, uh, another VM because there is a, um, a, another module. Import module, Hyper-V ARBIC admin, and... Uh, yeah, and here I can say pull database from computer PSHV00, and that is a, a SQLite database. I can't do a PowerShell uh, a conference session without mentioning SQLite. So there are a couple of VMs, and those VMs, now we are introducing a concept of VM groups as defined by NIST. So we can, in our database, assign VMs to groups. We can uh, assign ACLs permissions both to VMs and groups and then accumulate that permission. I did not implement a deny, but that would be as easy to do as uh, anything else. So this is, uh, this is basically what's behind the scene. And uh, the CVM does have a, a mapping to, to, to Alice's SID. And this uh, administration module um, allows me to do the basic Hyper-V back admin, allows me to do basic administration of that database. I pull the database from my computer, I uh, um, import host VMs so that I've got the IDs and names of those VMs in the database, and then I could put VMs into groups, or I can uh, assign permissions, and so on. And then, of course, I would push the, database, uh, push the database back. We could absolutely check that that works. VM name B, VM01. It is actually one of Bob's VMs, but Alice um, should be allowed to, to view it and permission is view. And then we just push the database uh, back. All this code will be published on Monday. Um, and I, I have to specify false because the database is already there. So, and then if we get back into, the, into Alice's session and just reissue that same command, 
we see the BVM at the bottom of the list. So, ARBIC level 300 with separation of logic between client and host. There, is, there are a couple of things to consider uh, implementing that. Data is being passed in full between host and client. So might want to limit what's being passed back because virtualization related object types are very verbose. You get row deserialized types returned for which there are no format definitions out of the box, but format definitions could be absolutely stolen from the default Hyper-V uh, module, slightly edited. That's what you saw previously in the demo. The view was exactly the same as locally on a Hyper-V host or using the standard Hyper-V module. It's the XML file from the Hyper-V module where I just renamed the type to deserialized. So, we are strapped for time, and I would absolutely like to show you the last demo, but let's talk about clusters. What additional functionality we might want to provide if uh, our hosts are clustered? I can't think of anything else other than moving VMs from one host to another, but I would always... I would always discuss whether this uh, is something that application administrators uh, have to be aware of uh, in the first place. Because if they have a use case for healing something by moving a VM to another host, then you have a problem in your infrastructure that you've got to fix. That is not their problem. It's probably a MAC address getting stuck or something. Go ahead. The question was uh, if load balancing would be something that could help here. Absolutely, because where a particular VM is running should be managed by the infrastructure, not by the owner of that VM. And I mean, Hyper-V has, uh, has um, affinity rules since 2016. You can absolutely implement those if that's what you want. But using working with clusters presents a couple of hurdles that we need to overcome. We need a shared configuration because we do not know which host uh, the users will be connecting to, or at least we could, we could tell them to always connect to the first node, but what happens when we shut that down for maintenance? So we, we should be providing a common name for that, so we need to, 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 to deploy a common configuration to... Uh, to all the hosts in, in the cluster, um, locating VM to, to run commandlets against a VM. We, we need to know which host it is running on, and uh, it might not be the host the user is connected to using uh, PS remoting. And both moving and creating VMs, if we would like to provide that functionality, is a failover clustering operation as well as Hyper-V operation so that our custom commandlets will have to include both commands from the failover clusters module and the Hyper-V module. But it's all solvable. There is code in there. The other hurdle is authorization. Fred talked about using GMSA for uh, GIA. It's absolutely possible and it has uh, many advantages. Of course, uh, the GMSA account you provide must have enough permissions both on the host and on the cluster to do what, what it is required to do. I come from the security space. There is a way to pawn GMSA without touching the machines that are allowed to actually retrieve the password uh, of uh, that GMSA. So that could, in theory post a higher security risk to, 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 the whole, uh, to the whole infrastructure. And, of course, there are still orgs that are reluctant to implement GMSA. Uh, I don't know why that is, but uh, I encounter uh, those on a regular basis. You could get away with using a virtual account. And the virtual account, if it 
connects to external resources and another host in a cluster is an external resource uh, in that instance it then you need to uh, it acts as the machine identity so you need to make every host every node in the cluster an administrator both of the on the cluster and on all the other nodes but it could be in a more secure configuration that is uh, easier to maintain I have some code, I have some working code that will uh, show you that we can do exactly the same thing in a cluster. I will skip it for now because we have five minutes left and I would absolutely like to talk about providing a real user experience. We could, by hiding the business logic uh, behind the GIA endpoint, we could provide additional functionality. If we start providing things like creating new VMs or cloning, uh, cloning from templates, uh, we could introduce the concept of data stores without disclosing physical locations uh, behind these data stores. I have working code for that. It will not get up on Monday, but maybe in a couple of weeks. Cloning of template VMs. Windows Admin Center has the ability to do that. We could provide that uh, as well. We could even refine this capability. And then on the PowerShell side of things, we could provide tab completion, like doing the dynamic parameters, for instance. So if you, if you type, I connect, I would like to connect to host, uh, host, uh, PSHVO, um, then our, um, module would reach out per GIA to that host, retrieve the list of VM names that I would be allowed to put so, so that I could tab complete VM names or something along these lines. And I could also start doing weird and existing, uh, exciting stuff, like providing commandlets that would address a Hyper-V VM and a VMware VM and Xen Server VM behind the scenes. Nothing I couldn't do with that uh, GIA approach. I could do an approval workflow. If somebody decides they want to stop their VM, I could have my, my, my Hyper-V host under the hood reach out to their manager and ask for permission to do that. Absolutely, absolutely feasible stuff. And of course, I could provide extended audit logging for all, all these things. So now most of you, I assume, have worked or do still work in infrastructure. You probably know those application admin dudes. They are not and do that, of course, uh, they are not console-minded. Uh, console so providing them a graphical user interface is actually a desirable thing. Luckily for us, Microsoft has provided a framework for that. Windows Admin Center, I don't know if, if, if that is a known fact to everybody here, Windows Admin Center has what they call a role-based access control capability. What that is, is they define three groups, reader, administrator, and uh, Hyper-V administrator on the managed machine, and deploy a GIA endpoint that is not there by default, uh, but it has a fixed name, Microsoft SME, you remember, Server Managed Experience 2018. Uh, and... Um, those, uh, those three groups actually get roles assigned to them, which restricts what they can do. And it is a, there is a dragon down that path. WAC requires that this endpoint be unrestricted, be a, a default remote host, not a restricted remote host. So if you're implementing that, you shouldn't be providing direct access by PowerShell for for the permissioned users. They should be required to go through Windows Admin Center to reach that endpoint, firewall. But uh, apart from that, it's just a bunch of modules. It's just a bunch of modules that we can remove signatures from and edit at convenience, which leads us to the following result. If Alice were to connect to our host OO using Windows Admin Center, 
limited access, which means she is connected to the SME endpoint, not to the default endpoint. And if we point her to virtual machines and they load, and it's all running here on the laptop, she only gets to see her two VMs. It's the authorization table from the first example. And if I, if I were to do that, I'm sure you believe me, but if I were to do that as Bob, then I would have basically the same experience, but I would get to see different VMs. So, let's wrap this up. There are a couple of things still left to do. Decide upon which architecture we are to follow. Implement all the things. Design a certain central store. I'm envisioning SQL with a local cache as SQLite and some facility to pull that down on a regular basis. A management interface for all those permissions. If we would be doing WAC, then a WAC extension would be great. And then there is not something for console connections, and I'm over time. Thank you for sticking with me so far. Enjoy the rest of the conference.